Like DeSantis, in effect, for half a million dollars, how much have we spent, actually funded the first official amnesty flight in U.S. history. I think that's the podcast right there. Yeah, you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Ron DeSantis loves immigrants. <laughs> even, Ron if, De- even if he doesn't know it. Even doesn't know it. Yeah. Here, here's an attack ad from uh, uh, as the Republican Civil War heats up. Ron DeSantis loves Mexicans. <laughs> that's it. That's the whole ad. Because, uh, you know, yeah. everybody who listens to that would be like, oh, Mexican. He's talking about, uh, what's that word? Immigrant? Well, Mexican. <laughs> I'm talking about Mexican. <laughs> Welcome to the Coming to America podcast, brought to you by Frontier Tech Law. My name is Damien DeNoble, also known as Damien. And I'm Eli McDonald. And in this podcast, we are going to be covering what is the most politically charged topic in the world, uh, which is the movement of people from one country to another, i.e. immigration. And we want to take an approach that's going to give you something interesting to think about without being overtly political in any way. In fact, I don't want to touch on American politics, for example, if I don't have to help it just because we're filming in the United States, because immigration is actually a global problem, right? It's a global problem that many, many, many countries, perhaps all countries are trying to solve, whether that's because they have people emigrating or they have people emigrating, don't know what to do. This touches environmental issues. This touches uh, social conflict. It touches Uh, conflicts that are endemic to particular societies. But we also want to give you some interesting stuff. So every episode, we're going to try to touch on the story of someone that's probably uh, known to you. And one of those stories today, the story today is, uh, stick around, we're talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, perhaps the greatest basketball player in the world, uh, many, many would say so, who has a fascinating journey of, of, uh, you know, immigration. So Eli, what, um, you want to say a little bit about yourself just so people know where, where you come from? Uh, uh, Eli is, uh, going to be a lawyer here next year, currently a third year student, a law student at Quinnipiac law school. We've worked together for two and a half years now. We have, we have, yeah, I, I started out working in, um, in the Southeast in immigration and in detention centers and, um, decided to go to law school to pursue it. And, um, I've worked with Damien in a number of capacities now, but really excited to... Uh... You took the most insane assignment. You took the most insane assignment. It's 2020. It's the summer. And my wife is like, hey, there's this guy, Eli. He knows um, this amazing woman I work with. And he's an immigration. Eli. I'm like, does he speak Spanish? Which is always my first little word, because I don't really. And uh, she's like, yeah, yeah, like big, big on it, like, like big on it. I was like, yeah, yeah, like, uh, I'll see what we can do. I mean, we're shut down. You know, it's like May 2020, we're shut down. But I got in this PPP money. And the thing about the PPP money, you have to pay it to people who work for you. And so I was like, okay, I need somebody in the middle of COVID to go down to rural Georgia in what's maybe the most notorious detention center in the United States and I need you to go interview some people in the middle of COVID. Also, you're going to go by yourself. You can stay at this uh, really rundown kind of place. Uh, what was that like, actually, that first? What did? You, what, I don't even know what I told you anymore, but you did it. The point is, you went there, you interviewed folks. It, it was wild. It was absolutely wild. It was, uh, yeah, like Damien said, it's the most notorious detention center in the country. Um, it was in the throes of COVID. I immediately found out when I went that they... Uh, we're not allowing us to enter the detention center. Um, so I, I interviewed everybody um, connected to it that I could. And yeah, it was it was a full panic for them, like it was for um, the rest of the country in terms of operating the center. And yeah, it was, it was a giant mess, like the rest of the country down there. But it was really interesting. Um, What's it like being in the middle of rural Georgia in COVID? Nobody really wants to see you. There's nowhere to... And what, what possessed you to take that job? I mean, I think we we were all in the immigration community wondering what was happening in these detention centers. Yeah, I think kind yeah. of this iron curtain came down at the beginning of COVID. You're like, is everyone dying? Do exactly. they getting any sort of treatment? And exactly. you're are the these... courts still operating? Are the judges yeah. still coming to work? So it was it was hard to get information. I, I'll, I'll say that. Um, mm-hmm. But talking to the county commissioner and there, those, it it has such an economic 
impact in that area that everybody's affected by it. Everybody yeah. I talked to in some way was affected by it. Um, so I had to do an end around to kind of figure out what was going on inside um, in a lot of ways. Well, badass. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so you did that. That's how we met. And then you worked here this summer and you're going to work here next year and um, you're going to be helping with this podcast. We're going to be co-hosts. So welcome. But Eli's a badass, uh, for those of you wondering. And uh, we're, we'll hear more and more stories. He, he wrote a motorcycle shirtless <laughs> Along the uh, southern border wall without a helmet, which is dumb, but it's fine. He's like, I'm so fucking handsome. I'm really going to go down this thing. That's <laughs> you think it was for looks, but you're much more aerodynamic. I saved about $7 on gas. Yeah, so yeah that's, that's if, if I had a hairless chest and was like a muscular guy, but no, it's just aerodynamic. I don't wear a shirt because uh, I don't want the air dragging me down as I walk through the town. That's what I do. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. That's what I do. The shirts really slow me down when I walk and I wish, I wish I, but now I know. You'd be surprised. Yeah, I'd be surprised. All right. So we are going to, we're going to start the show with immigration headlines. Uh, and then we are going to, in the second part of the show, we're going to be talking about Antetokounmpo, Giannis. Okay. The chapters are down there for you. You're watching this on YouTube. If you're on any of the kind of audio platforms, we're also putting in chapters. So feel free to skip to what you like. Eli, start us off. What's going on here? Yeah, so for, for immigration headlines, Biden has tried and failed uh, to make some big changes, um, and he recently succeeded in making a pretty huge change um, in immigration. Um, I just did a top 10 video of how things haven't changed. <laughs> Explain, what is what has he changed? What, I, what, what congressional law, what, what congressional action has been made to change our immigration system? I think your video still stands because this is an exception to the rule. Okay. Hands down. Um, and long story short, he basically empowered immigration officers at the border um, to approve asylum cases. Okay. Um, and that's the crux of it. He empowered them to do essentially the job of a judge in certain cases. Um, if the officer wants to deny the case, then they just refer it straight to a court system. You're talking about Customs and Border Patrol officers. Or are you talking about something uh, about, else? About asylum officers. Asylum, asylum officers. Asylum officers. Okay, so yeah. what's an asylum officer, just for those who may not know? So essentially an asylum officer is somebody who um, conducts an asylum interview, sits down with an immigrant, um, and hears their asylum case. And um, in first step is trying to determine if they have something called credible fear. Yes. Or just credible yes. fear. And so, so uh, President Biden has said, uh, you now, not only can you make a credible fear determination, but you can also do what? You can also approve the case. Um, and and importantly, they only have the power to approve. Um, Interesting. Only the power to approve. So if they if they see a case they want to deny, essentially the immigrant is in the same position they would have been um, beforehand, where they're um, referred to to the court system to a, to a judge. I wonder if if that uh, decision not to approve will be held against them by some immigration judges. That's a great question. Yeah, I think the program is so new um, that there's not a ton of metrics on it. A positive metric is that the outcomes have been roughly similar to what we see in the court systems um, in terms of approval. And yeah, the the scary part about it is they only give them, I think, four to six weeks of training to do this job mm -hmm. as compared to a, a judge who's... Um, Sometimes has zero training if they're appointed well, yes. by the certain <laughs> president. Yeah. Very true. Very yeah. true. I've been in front of some judges with zero immigration knowledge. Yeah, they've I'll come from like JAG or something. They're like, oh, well, that's not the way I think immigration law should work. I'm like, yeah, that's that's uh, that's irrelevant here. Also, immigration judges aren't judges. Very true. All right. They're administrative officers themselves, but we do this weird thing where we want to pretend that we're kind of like in a in a real court in immigration. And so we call them judges and your honor. And I just, part of me just wants to go, uh, listen, Bob, <laughs> listen, I know you're wearing robes and we're cosplaying like that. This is a, an actual court, right? But you're a, you're in a executive branch official and I'm an officer of an actual court. And I don't, I don't, I don't actually want to kind of, um, uh, Listen to anything you have to say. I, I, I really don't. After sitting in a lot of immigration courts, I think uh, cosplay is a perfect way to describe it, except for yeah. uh, the people cosplaying uh, immigrants still have very, very real impacts. To deal with, <laughs> That's, which dark. Is, That's dark. That's dark. <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, practicing something like Charlotte immigration courts through what we practice, what we mentioned before. At one point, you had these rates of denial that were at 98%, effectively right. 100%, right? right. Uh, uh, it was 100% for immigrants from Latin America and South America and Africa. Right. Right. And those that 1% that would sneak through would be somebody like, 
oh, I spoke uh, incorrectly in France. I'm very beautiful. I have long blonde hair. I need some saving. And the judge was like, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we should clearly let you in. Speak, you know, I don't know what the hell that was. It's yeah, true. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I mean, compared to an immigration court in New Orleans mm-hmm. where it's roughly... 60% approval. Yeah. So that's, um, Th- this is the one thing I said in my top 10 being white still matters. It's great being European. We were looking at, you look at the Ukrainian, uh, uh, this system program for letting Ukrainians, which by the way, I'm like all for, um, I'm Bosnia myself. Much of Bosnia was settled by Ukrainians in the first half of 19th, 20th century. Like we, we share a lot of that culture. Those are my people. Um, but it took me two weeks to get somebody that was Ukrainian into the United States. Two weeks wow. from beginning to end, right? There's this advanced, you know, advanced parole process. Poor Afghanistanis, though, you yeah. know, helping the U.S. for decades. And the translators, I mean, there's, there's horrific um, pieces that have come out about the scrambles at American bases, you know, trying to get through. Right. And this goes back to immigration you know choices because they're not congressionally legislated every every sort of slowdown that we have it's by choice absolutely everywhere where the system is slow or clogged it's by choice because long ago congress gave away the power to actually administer this to the executive branch and for better or for worse the executive branch has ultimate power as we saw under the trump administration and so i think we play a lot of pretend in the system whether it's cost playing judges mm-hmm. Who don't know the immigration law, or it's uh, cosplaying uh, executive branch members who pretend that they can't do better. Which brings us to maybe uh, the next couple of stories. Sure. We love our viewers, and if you've been watching the show for a while, then you know I'm a big fan of our next sponsor, Bureaucratic Inefficiency. I love it in the morning, I love it in the afternoon, my friends love it. I've been working with Bureaucratic Inefficiency for years. There's nothing better than a nice warm cup of Bureaucratic Inefficiency in the morning to slow your day down. If you would like 10% off your next bout with Bureaucratic Inefficiency, go to bureaucraticinefficiency.com slash law slash more, 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 dash, two, seven, dash, C, dash, I, 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 F, G, slash, red tape, slash, go, to get 15% off. Uh, there may be other terms and conditions that apply. Yeah, the many of us have probably heard the story on the news in the past uh, two, three weeks about the, the migrants who are bust to... Which Martha, ones? To Martha's Vineyard. Martha's, Martha's Vineyard, Vineyard migrants. One that, of my favorite stories of the year. Unbelievable. I, totally believable. Totally believable. Totally believable. Totally believable. <laughs> totally believable. Like it wasn't the first. This was, Ron DeSantis actually copied another governor. True. True, true, so true. totally the, believable. The Lone Star program in Texas, yeah. which, we'll, which we'll get into. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because this is the one that poked through yeah. and that people uh, people's ears pricked up to. And this has been going on. Um, and... Yeah, so the the story essentially, people on the border were being offered not only free rides, but potentially free work and shelter yeah. um, if they were bused to Chicago and New York, I think were the two primary ones um, that this story came out of. Um, these people in Martha's Vineyard thought they were going to New York um, and end up on Martha's Vineyard, which if, if you have not gone, um, is not New York. Yeah. It's very different from New York. Yeah, what's Martha's um, Vineyard like? We're in Connecticut, by the way, so we're very close to Martha's Vineyard. In fact, the same indigenous peoples that uh, lived here, the here we're, we're in the kind of Peacock Indian territory, right, right. also lived on Long Island where Martha's Vineyard is, right? Right. And still live there, in fact, right? And, and, and which is, I have, a, I, have a, I have a quip to come back to that later. Okay, they got, yeah, yeah. Um, but here's the thing about the Martha's Vineyard story. You substitute anything but human beings into what Ron DeSantis is, and it has the potential to be hilarious. Absolutely. Like anything else. Absolutely. Okay. So just, uh, so Martha's Vineyard, it's this hoity-toity wasp stronghold, maybe the wasp stronghold. If there's a coastal elite on the East Coast. It's the penthouse of the ivory tower. It's the penthouse yeah. of the ivory tower. Not even, the, the ivory tower is like, that's more like academics. They okay, don't have that fair. kind of money, right? <laughs> sure. No, except for Barack Obama, he has, he has that <laughs> kind of money. All the post presidents do, but it's 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 the penthouse, it's the wasp penthouse, and then you have Florida, and you know which has branded itself as uh, the home of Florida man, 
right? Who 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 smokes meth and um, does crazy things? Seems like all the time, right? And yeah. so, really, the story is: Florida man sends pet house wasp a gift. <laughs> That's the story, right? Like you break it down and that can be hilarious. Like what if, what if Martha's Vineyard in, uh, had received instead of a busload of human beings, which is horrific and sinister, Yes. right? Yes. But what if Florida man uh, had instead sent something that nobody at Martha's Vineyard would ever like? What if they sent them, um, oh, I don't know, gifts from Walmart? <laughs> what if it was just like Walmart goods? It was just like a, it's like, here's somewhere, someplace you've never been, a Walmart, and uh, I've just sent you a bunch of gifts. And then Martha's Vineyard yeah. opens and they're like, oh my God, like, why would I want this many <laughs> sippy cups? But then some uh, somebody on Martha's Vineyard is like, oh, this is a pretty cool sippy cup. Maybe we should yep. like go to Walmart. Like it could have been friendly like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. It, it, it could have been mean, you know? You, Maybe maybe you send them. What's like a really kind of Florida man thing, you know, something that Martha's Vineyard would never would never touch. Oh, maybe they could have sent them a bunch of public colleges. You know, that, maybe Florida could have just sent ten public colleges to Martha's Vineyard. Everybody be like, "Oh my God, I've never seen one of those. What is that?" Federally guaranteed what is, tuition. What the yeah. hell is a Pell Grant? Why is a Pell Grant being unloaded from this car? You know, it could have been so much better. Uh, but but it was cruel. And so what what's the final outcome? So Martha's Vineyard kind of uh, takes their meager resources and actually figures out how to help forty four people. It's, I mean, the, the story itself, once the people arrived, is is incredible. People um, in the middle of the night coming out of their houses, bringing people into their homes, yeah. feeding them, sheltering them. Maybe not exactly what DeSantis, uh, maybe not the uh, the chaos that he envisioned when, when he sent people up there. Um, but do you think he just envisioned? So I, I guess I, I'm saying is I think he just envisioned it would be funny because he's totally dehumanized these 44 people to begin with. I think you're right. I, I think it's owning the... You, you yeah. know somebody's moment, man, that just owned the Liz, man. That's hilarious. Sending yep. 44 Mexicans up to fucking Martha's Vineyard. Yep. Hilarious. Yeah. It was it was yeah. that. It was owning the Libs. I yeah. think that's what it was. Yeah. Um, but the, they, uh, so, so the thing they got, which is what our office did a lot of in North Carolina, we're kind of pulling back on that, but is U visas, mm. right? Um, and I think that the, the police department there, the police chief of Martha's Vineyard or whatever, whatever it is, uh, said they were victims of crime, certified them, and they're able to apply for U visas, which is a special program that even helps those who are undocumented. And I'm not sure these people were. I think these people had like TPS. Like, I think it was a mix. It was a mix. I, I think it was a mix. Yeah. A mix of, of people with some sort of status, or you know, and right. uh, and and some some undocumented folks. But at any rate, if their U visas are approved, eventually um, they would be eligible to get green cards. So in that way, DeSantis just legalized 44 people. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we could say that was an amnesty flight. Hmm. Like DeSantis, in effect, for half a million dollars, how much he spent, actually funded the first official amnesty flight in U.S. history. That's a podcast right there. Yeah, you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Ron DeSantis loves immigrants. <laughs> even, if, De even if he doesn't know it. Even doesn't know it. Yeah. Here, here's an attack ad from uh, uh, as the Republican Civil War heats up. Ron DeSantis loves Mexicans. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole ad. Because, uh, you know, yeah. everybody who listens to that would be like, oh, Mexican. He's talking about, uh, what's that word? Immigrant? Oh, uh, Mexican. <laughs> I'm talking about, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Next story. What's our next story? The next, the next story is uh, Title 42. And this has... And we learned some new new information about this before before we went to before we went to record. Okay, go ahead. We did, and and it's actually it's really telling because this uh, the research I did for this um, it's kind of all over the place. There's um, essentially Title Forty Two uh, to back up a little bit um, is essentially a public health um, law that was that has been used on the border um, to expel. Over a million people at this point, I believe, hmm. um, since Biden has has taken power, and in May, probably more accurate to say to expel people over a million times, to, because we do know a lot of people because of this have made multiple trips. Right, 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 right. I don't want to sensationalize it any more than it needs to, because it's already ridiculous that we use a public health code to 
<laughs> police are border but God. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. So Title 42 is basically a remnant of the of the Trump administration. Um, he put it into place. Basically, what has resulted is is massive migrant camps um, on the Mexican side of the border. Yeah. Hugely, hugely dangerous. Um, it's really been a field day for um, for gangs in that area. Yeah. Um, to prey on people, it's um, it's a travesty of of human rights, essentially. Um, and Biden has has. Since he took office, uh, this has been a big fight of his. Initially, he was forced to um, to fight for Title 42 in the courts. Um, and eventually in May, he announced that he was going to rescind the policy. May so, 2022. May 2022. Um, or by the end of May 2022 was his initial um, announcement. And that has not happened. I think you recently spoke with somebody who... Yeah, so um, I... I, um, I spoke to some folks at um, El Otro Lado, which is this fantastic organization um that has been uh really been doing incredible work um down at uh the border in um california for years um at the tijuana san diego border and uh one of their legal folks was helping me with um a client's friend who was seeking asylum she was a russian lady in her 60s seeking asylum down there and at first i was like that's a really bad idea you know it's not what you think uh she's like oh well she'll stay at a hotel and then she'll walk across the border to get asylum I'm like that's not how it works <laughs> you don't just walk across the border to get asylum and in fact that i knew i was aware of title 42 and i was aware of uh, before that we had mpp which has been rescinded and before that uh we just had essentially a whiteboard uh stapled to a tree and people come every morning and have their number called and if there wasn't called they would have to go back to their ramshackle houses four hours away anyway story for another day but what i was told is that 45 people are being let in a day at the border it's limited to 45 it runs seven days per week and i'm guessing that they go talk to an officer i don't know much of the story from there right yeah, to see yeah. if they're if they have credible fear but essentially the number of people entering you do 45 times 7, right? That's 4 times 7, 280. Is that 300? No, 10, 4, 50. This is so embarrassing. 90, one, there's nothing more embarrassing than doing <laughs> math on camera. I think it's 415. I'm so no, glad you didn't ask me for the math. I think it's 315. And yeah, yeah and, and for context, the single plaza that I, that I was reading about um, directly across from El Paso houses roughly 2,500 uh, migrant families it's right crazy. now. It's right crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so those, those numbers are not going far. They're not going far. And there's yeah. limited, apparently, exceptions to this 45 a day. Uh, and I'm guessing it's similar numbers at other border border crossings um, for people who are sick or infirm or right. you know, have cases. But, like, I've seen people, and I was in Tijuana last time, with, like, machete cuts, like, from the war in Cameroon, right? Yeah, this kind absolutely. of frankly, and no prioritization. No, you, you no, know, absolutely like not. People are like, okay, so Title Forty Two. So, what's the big lesson here in Title Forty Two? Is this does this fit in with our theme um, that I've sort of established earlier, which is that things are like this because we choose them to be? Do we? Is there, you know, realistically, you know, you what what are the options for the Biden administration? Right, he won in the midterms. Uh, we know that the immigration um, stirring up of anti-immigration sentiment pretty much won, I think, the election for Trump in 2016. Right. Uh, we know that we've been able to get no traction in Congress on any sort of legislation for a decade and a half. What's Biden's option, right? I, I mean, I, I think... Two of the stories that we're talking about today are pretty intricately tied. I think this change um, that he made empowering the asylum officers is directly tied to this. I think he's he's looking at the Title 42 situation and on one hand recognizing that it's an incredibly powerful tool uh, to regulate the border and also realizing the obvious that it's um, an absolute travesty for, for the humans involved in it. Uh, so I, I think he's realizing that um, somehow we're going to have to speed it up somehow. Like if, if, if he's going to shut this program down, um, and we are going to have this influx, then something has to change. And I don't think this is a silver bullet by any measure, but I, I would say that asylum change is at least a step in that direction to, to speed up the queue a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what they've been doing. That's not, this doesn't get as much news, but one of the things that he did in July, there was a big, um, there's a big Congress kind of, of Latin American countries, um, 
along with you know the U.S. Uh, Biden Biden actually I think attended, and his other big push is to bring in more temporary workers that legally mm-hmm. work here. And so USAID and other kind of um, agencies that work with the U.S. agencies have been beefing up the ability of some of the smaller countries to do their own recruitment of workers, mm-hmm. right, to vet them. Um, Mission Mexico, which handles H-2B and H-2A workers, has been like beefed up to mm-hmm. make sure that that program can handle even more capacity because mm-hmm. we had a 450,000 H-2A farm workers come in last year for temporary work. Um, we did a hundred, about 130, 140,000 H-2B workers. The demand is closer to a quarter million per year, right? And so if, and, and. I think a lot of people in, and um, that are coming across the border who aren't, you know, we're not talking to asylum seekers that are crossing the seas from Bangladesh, you know, Africa, but a lot of the migration, which is coming from the Northern Triangle uh, and coming from Mexico, uh, those are people looking for work, right? That are coming from Latin America, Mexico, Northern Triangle has had many, many problems over the years, including uh, environmental change. Right. right. So uh, farmland in Guatemala, Honduras, especially in the highlands, just isn't what it's used to, used to be. So people are needing to move up to find work. Uh, Mexico has its own set of issues, right? Big country, many complex issues. Um, you have narco states, but you also have, you know, water issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so people are coming to work. And we used to have the only program we had was where people come across the border, work for a number of months and, and go back. Today, we have H-2A, H-2B, but because of our post-9-11 laws, which penalize multiple border crossings uh, and prevent people from coming back ever legally after that, uh, many folks who would cross decided to stay in the country, right? So it kind of had the opposite effect of what was intended, where people were still making the journey because of um, many different necessities, one of them being economic, but now... They were being told, well, if you go back, you're going to have a really hard time coming in or ever finding any sort of legal status. Right. Um, so I do think that one good focus, I don't know how you feel, but is is making sure that our work programs, uh, number one, meet the demand of U.S. employers. And number two, that, you know, they're big enough to meet the demand of, uh, you know, uh, all the people that are being pushed by different push factors to come to the U.S. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I think creating that opportunity to – to earn money and return home. I, I think a lot of Americans don't understand that that is the goal for, for many immigrants who come here yeah. is to support their family. And well, it's and, demonized. Right. As soon as you right. say that, as soon as you say that people go, Oh, so they're coming here to make money and not pay taxes. It's like, well, they could pay taxes, right? If, if, if we legalize more of it, right, there could be a lot more tax paying. Although in my experience, undocumented families tend to pay a lot of taxes. I, I, I think there's been studies done that, uh, both, Crime rates and taxes are more favorable metrics for immigrants than Americans. I think they pay their taxes at, right. at a comparable rate at, at the least and at a higher rate than Americans. Well, this, this is where that argument um, that you'll see in a lot of think tanks where it's like, well, we want more immigrants so we can have Social Security for longer. Right. Which tries to appeal to older voters. Okay. Right. Our sponsor of this episode is somebody that I've trusted for a long time, especially in these recession times, Old Ass Mattress. Why buy a fancy, adjustable, super smart foam, hoity toity smart mattress when you can just buy an old ass mattress? Go to oldassmattress.com slash FTLaw to get 15% off a old ass mattress an additional 20% off available if you don't mind that somebody peed on it. DACA, the ongoing saga. I touched on this a bit in my last video, but go ahead. Take us, what's the ongoing sad saga of the DACA program? Yeah, on, ongoing saga is right. Um, I mean, with we could do a whole podcast, um, as you know, on, on the history of this program um, created in 2012. I, I think it would be best right now to kind of look at where it is. Um, yeah, in this, where is it? In this current moment. Currently, if you have DACA um, or you need to renew, uh, that window is still open for you. Um, You're able to renew um, as long as you're not expired for more than one year. Um, But a big change this year um, in October, uh, there was a Fifth Circuit decision. And essentially, although the government is accepting new applications, um, they're not processed. Basically, they're they're creating a stack of them um, on a desk or in a room somewhere, um, not not even looking at them, not processing them. So if if you're in the program already, if you need to reapply, you got to do it within one year and you're good. Otherwise, um, it's on hold. It's on hold. My fear is that it's dead. I, my, my fear is that it's dead because at, at, at this point, 
the Supreme Court is not going to change uh, these injunctions that I believe in the fifth, right? Right. The, the yep. fifth circuit, yep. right? Which is the uh, in Texas. And uh, the Supreme Court's not going to overturn that, which means that the only way forward for DACA is, number one, a president could pull Andrew Jackson and just say, we don't care about that. We're going to make DACA happen anyway, at which point we probably do a lot of damage to the structure of the government. People are going to have different opinions about that. Right. The other thing that can happen is that you have congressional action to actually put DACA into law. That's not going to happen uh, with the current makeup of the political parties. Right. Right. And we have two years now of a lame duck session. It's definitely not going to happen then. That was the Democrats' goal for this lame duck session was to fix DACA. Yeah. And um, they did not. Yeah. It's yeah. Well, it's not going to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be a lot like abortion for Democrats where they're going to be running on it for a long time and right. loath to fix it. Right. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. that. That's the prediction. That's the cynical prediction. I think DACA is dead. Um, and barring, at least for new applicants, for sure. Yeah. I don't think it's going to get opened back up. I think we filed three applications in the first week that it opened and those folks got stuck. Um, I think it's going to be one of these things where people are going to be pins and needles trying to figure out, can I get renewed? Can I get renewed? Right. My best advice to DACA applicants is go ahead and get married to somebody with status and get those advanced paroles while you can uh, so you can adjust. You know, there's a window Absolutely. now to do that. And even that window had closed, right, yeah. uh, under the previous administration. Unfortunately, yeah. it's, um, yeah, it's not great. It's not great. Okay. Not great. So that's the sad story of DACA. Uh, ongoing saga, although I think that saga is close to an end. Okay. Right. So now I'm going to put on my hat. Because we're talking basketball. We're talking basketball. Uh, we are, this is, this is the part of the show where we switch from the topics at hand and we go into a personal story about somebody you know. And today we're talking about one of my favorite basketball players, one of my favorite people. Um, I just think he's a swell dude. Giannis Antetokounmpo. It is. Giannis. Giannis. Yeah, he, he's, he has, he has an unbelievable story. My when I first became aware of his story, he gave an interview talking about he and his three brothers um, lying in, a, in their shared bed that they barely fit in. in, in Can Greece. you imagine those guys sharing a bed? That was That's one of the funniest parts of the story. Um, and all of them dreaming about uh, playing in the NBA. And now all three of them are. Um, so it's, Is it three or four brothers? He has four brothers who all play basketball. Francis, Alex, brothers. Costas, and Thanasis. And we'll have we'll have this put up on screen. We'll get it. Well, I'm sure by the time this goes to edit, there's a nice photo of this above our faces. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, if we were trying to do a dry immigration podcast, we could go into O visas and how um, yeah. and how the NBA functions. But I think it's much more interesting just to talk about his his story and how it um, take me through it. Man. it so you, you've done the research on this. So and I'll just kind of ooh and on and, and um, not pretend that I haven't read all your <laughs> research, which is the truth. So. <laughs> Yeah, so Ted um he was born in 94 um, in Athens, Greece, um, to Nigerian immigrant parents. Um, was that was that Beauty and the Beast? That's when Beauty and the Beast it. came out. Beauty and the Beast, was that 94? You're obviously a much bigger fan than I am. So he's I'm probably a little a, embarrassed. He could be. A, I'm, not, I'm not saying he is, but he could be a Beauty and the Beast. He could. Baby, like that could have All been right, the that, song. That'll be in the next, the next podcast. That could have been. So if you want your kid to grow big, you have to procreate <laughs> while Beauty and the Beast is playing in the... Yeah, yeah. Is that a fair, like, is that a good lawyerly conclusion? It's a good medical conclusion. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a medical expert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he had a very, uh, he had a challenging childhood. His, his parents um, were Nigerian immigrants. Um, they lived there without status. Um, he was born in Athens, Greece, like I said, um, but Greece does not have birthright citizenship. Yeah. Um, so his family was was existing in um in an unlawful status his he and his brother sold uh watches on the street i believe yeah. for a while he um he was afraid to go out at night with his brothers from uh golden dawn the neo-nazi party yeah um, in greece they're incredibly active in his neighborhood um and in power and in and, power and in power and in power yeah so he yeah, it was, it was a tough childhood for him, and it kind of all turned around um, when Spiros Felinatis, Felinatis um, discovered him. He's, he's a Greek basketball coach, 
Um, his brothers always, he and his brothers always loved to play, but he was kind of the first one who got noticed. How much um, credit does that guy deserve though? Like how much, how much talent does it take to walk down? She'd be like, Oh, <laughs> holy shit. You're six foot 11. You're 12. I know what you should do because you're six foot 11 and 12 years old. <laughs> you know, he may have also stood out a little bit in the youth, uh, Greek basketball leagues. Yeah. It is possible that, yeah. he, that he stood out quite a bit. That's, um, a, that's sort of like putting LeBron James in a, in a Jewish league yes. in Philadelphia. Yes. It's definitely. like, a, why does he stand out? Oh, he doesn't wear a yarmulke. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's what it is. That's what Ari Shafir was the tallest player in his Jewish league. He's a comedian. Oh, uh, yeah. He's yeah, six yeah, yeah. four. You know, he's like, that was he's a giant. Four. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, good he, special by the way yeah so the, this guy by mm -hmm. some miracle um, found these guys found these brothers um, he offered his uh, his parents jobs he kind of helped lift the lift the family up kind of um, steered him through um, the various like development leagues and yeah, but and, Greeks are superpower in basketball like they are, they are, right? they are. so it's, it's the Greeks Croatians French they're kind of always playing it's serious there. Spot. it's yeah. serious there yeah and he um, a lot of American players that's true. Yeah. And he was yeah. in incredibly decorated through all those leagues. Um, and the interest where the story gets interesting is his NBA career almost didn't happen. Um, it almost didn't happen when he had kind of reached the pinnacle of these Greek leagues. Um, he, he wanted to come to the U S I think the nuggets were looking at him. Um, and he didn't have citizenship. He was essentially stateless. Yeah. Um, so there was a huge back and forth um, for months and months where it wasn't even clear if he could come. Um, and essentially, he had to go through the special process and petition the, the Greek government directly. And long story short, they gave him Greek citizenship. Okay, but let's break this. So that is fascinating. And it's fascinating because a lot of people are not familiar with the stateless concept. There are stateless people all over the world. Okay. For a brief moment in time, I myself was stateless. All right? I was born in a country that doesn't exist for example, or there's lots of ways to become stateless, right? Right. So you're born in a country that doesn't exist, or you're born in a country where there's no birthright citizenship. And to have citizenship in your original country, you have to, you know, either get registered through your parents, which you might not be able to do because like, you know, Giannis, you're already living somewhere. Um, but a lot of times you can just like kind of lose your country. And what that means is that you are kind of a non-entity under international law. Right. Right. You're a non-entity. So even to adjust status in the U.S. can be very problematic, right, if you're stateless, because what are you switching from? Are you an right. arriving alien? What are you? Um, if you're seeking asylum or, you know, you are or if you need to be deported, for example, where do you go? Right. Right. And it doesn't always end the way you think it should. Oh, well, they've got no country to back to. Of course, they should stay here. There, there are plenty of detention centers around the country which have been filled with, for example, stateless South Sudanese people right. who will stay there for five, six. I, I remember with one case, I think it was in Louisiana. I mean, he might have been in Stewart for a while. Um, but he was there for like five years because he couldn't get a passport. And so he was just right. forced to stay in prison. People end up having to shop around for their, uh, for their statehood. I mean, Giannis was reaching out to Nigeria mm -hmm. uh, to try to get a passport. Oh, yeah. Is that how it works? You're like shopping around. That's funny. So that's, I mean, that's, that's how it was described in, in his story. He was, um, he needed to come here for the NBA draft basically. And that's like, they were up against this, um, this deadline of the NBA draft and the Greek government wasn't budging at first. You need at least one parent born there, um, for them to consider it. And he was reaching out to Nigeria to try to get a passport. Um, and at the last minute, the Greek government uh, just stepped in, um, and mm -hmm. It's pretty unclear from my research exactly what strings were pulled, uh, yeah. but I think they realized, I don't know if it's the economic opportunity they saw him having or his, his potential fame. I'm really not sure, but it was kind of a 11th hour um, Greek government. Here you go. Passport. Yeah. Um, and then he was all set. Yeah. They're lucky that he was the first one to go to the NBA. I don't think they would have done that for Thanos. It's probably true. They're like, well, this... Uh, <laughs> This guy's gonna probably average three points a game. I don't uh I don't think it's uh worth it taking a bribe for that. Yeah. But but Giannis, he might be top they're like he might be top twenty all time. Yeah. If they knew he would be what he is now, they'd be like, Oh, we should definitely do that. Like if they knew Absolutely. they had the next they would have they would have flown him themselves. I they would have flown him themselves. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but th this so that's an interesting little tidbit though, right? So immigration's not created equal, right? Is right. one thing that we see in this story. Right. Right. So how many 
people with the same origin story as Giannis are still stateless on Greek streets, right? Exactly. If you've ever traveled to any sizable European city in the past decade and a half, you've seen, because you can't not see it, the loads of migrants from Central East Africa that just live on the street, sell trinkets, um, are totally kind of ignored and ostracized, Right. right, from those societies. Right. And that phenomenon has had profound political implications. Uh, and we haven't even, you know, we, we're going to be touching on the Syrian crises. We're going to be touching on uh, mass migration events on the 90s, eventually in these podcasts. But Giannis is one of the boat people, essentially. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, that's the crazy thing. And he's one of the boat people that was completely ignored and, you know, terrorized Right. By countries that were not ready to see dark skin right. as uh, someone that's part of their nation. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think the interesting thing is, you know, flipping through your news sources on an, any given night, um, you read about Title 42 and a family at the border um, who's stuck there. And then you flip over and you're watching Giannis in the NBA. And you could be looking at a very similar immigration story that's turned out you know, in a very, very different way. Um, so it's not created equal for, for anybody, for and, anybody. And, and yeah. I wonder, right. So he has to, you can't not be acutely aware of the fact that you are as, as someone stateless. You're not even a second class citizen because you're not a citizen at all. Right. You're, you're something below that, right? right? You're totally vulnerable and, um, you can't help but see the racial dimension of that. Right. And now he comes to Milwaukee. Now, Milwaukee, You know, as far as I know, it's one of these cities that does have a black population from the Great Migration in the 1900s. That was due to the fact that uh, post-reconstruction Jim Crow created a terrorist state, right, in the southern U.S. Uh, But you still have a population there that's, like, heavily isolated. And I wonder, like, what Giannis sees when he goes on the streets. Right. Does, Does he see some of the elements of his life as a stateless entity stateless person does he see some of that in the black population of milwaukee you know what is his philosophy around being in a in a a mostly white state otherwise and then you think about all these things must be going through his mind right you know but he stayed so gracious and diplomatic and it's this thing that i always talk about like in the united states we're all single uh, we're we're all a country uh, with a population of one in the sense mm-hmm. that we all have to be diplomats when we go outside. That's one of the wonders of America. Right. You get here and you realize everybody has very unique lives in their private homes. They have they come from a bajillion cultures, and to get through your day, especially if you live in a non-homogenous place, which I can't quite say where I live now in Connecticut, right? But could say in, in North Carolina. Could. Can't, yeah. can't, can't really know like where I live on the coast. I can't really say it's pretty homogenized, but yeah. it's the closest thing I've ever seen to uh, like the Scandinavian country up here, but mm-hmm. <laughs> New Haven not, right? And Hartford not, but then New Haven not and Hartford not, that's its own thing, right? That's its own uh, historic result of historical segregation, but whatever. Right. Right. But you have to be a diplomat of one. Uh, and that means sometimes holding your tongue. It means like sometimes uh, finding uh, a way to say something without being insulting. And people who take that to uh, to a level in the way that Giannis has is, is pretty impressive to watch. I'm not right. sure I would be that unbitter. And I say that as a former refugee. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for him, yeah. it's an even more extreme example. If you, you know, imagine the the interplay of these two things in his head, you know, he has this lived experience of being stateless, you know, um, selling trinkets in the street. Like we talked about, um, experiencing Milwaukee through this, um, through this lens and then, uh, being made a millionaire superstar who, you know, who every, every American, um, knows who, yeah. not even every American, but he's, he's known all over the world. Um, do you think Ari Shafir and other kids in the Jewish basketball league, uh, really are like, I'm going to grow up to be like Giannis. I hope not for their sake. <laughs> I'm going to grow up to be seven foot two and be able to dunk it from the three point line. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Every American kid wants to be Giannis and they know they can one day with enough hard work. Yeah, okay. Okay. Absolutely. What is, okay. So getting to technicality, what is his current status though? 
like so he did end up he he comes on I'm I'm guessing some sort of B1 B2 visa after getting his Greek um citizenship and then what happens does he come does he come directly on an O1 visa does he basically comes on basically comes on O1 visa um okay yeah and if and certain people who don't which can be event based you can apply for those event based so i'm sure they applied for it for like the draft and then sought right. to extend it for the season or something right exactly um so what are the technicalities so 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 what's he on and then how typical is that for other basketball players so for for the NBA, O1 is the most typical. Um, there's three to six evidence categories that you need to prove uh, regarding your profession and regarding what why you qualify for this. Um, ex- aliens of extraordinary ability is what is what yeah. the O1 visa is. So there's three to six evidence categories. Yeah. Um, this is the NBA Jam visa. Right. 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 <laughs> um, this is the, this is the it is the aliens <laughs> of extraordinary ability take over the bodies of. Charles Barkley, <laughs> Muggsy Bogues, and uh, what was his name? Uh, what was the tall, lanky white guy? Well, anyway, <laughs> he, uh, he's not in one of their bodies. He's um, not. At, the, at this time, no. at least. So no. he, yeah, so he, he the met. The aliens would have beat Michael Jordan if, if Giannis was there, I think. Uh, they took over Giannis's body. Yeah, I'd, I'd put money on that. I'd put money on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe. Yeah, so for the technicalities, he basically has to meet some of these evidence categories. Um, he needs um, a, la- a l- basically his job to vouch for him so that the NBA team that's interested in, in him, or, or maybe the, the organization as a whole does the original um, letter. For, it's for, an I-129 right. filing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's that's about it. So you have to prove your field of expertise through those categories, um, get a little support from um, an employer and, and obviously some other some other do they ever transition stuff, to like a green card or citizenship right that's a fantastic question yeah 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 i don't know i, I, yeah, I would assume so right like after enough years on no one you'd, you'd have a maybe you become a franchise player like the nba petitions for you right one of the teams petitions for you yeah that would make sense to me I'd, yeah i'd like to look into that more yeah let's about, look into uh, that we'll mark that mark mark that yeah. how do you become a citizen in today's nba from the O one, yeah, right. I become a right. U.S. citizen. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, very cool. So that's Guyana's story. Um, we're going to be covering some other things. We're going to be covering Jokic in a future in a future uh, episode next week. Um, okay. So yeah. just we wanted some conclusions. Okay. Uh, you had some stats for us on the on the NBA in terms of what this uh, what they are. Give us some stats. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the NBA is quipped as being the most uh, progressive sports uh, sports league in our yeah. country. And um, if you're judging that by a metric of immigration, I think that definitely holds up. Um, for the 2020-2021 season, um, there was a international player on every single roster yeah. um, in the NBA. Yeah. Um, 107 total from 41 countries on yeah. opening night. Um, and then comparing this to the 91-92 season, there were just 23 international players overall. Wow. Um, so it is... Now, you said progress. Is it a progressive league or, or, or like an international league? Because some people in the league still believe the earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> and some other people also believe that Jews control the media and the world. So I don't know if I would say it's the mm. most progressive league. It's certainly one that has been active, um, the most activist driven league, which is which is like a positive thing. But I think, I would I think you make a good point. But if you're comp- putting it next to the NFL and the MLB, it's yeah. not it's not a high bar. Come on, you know. come on, <laughs> come on. But the, the NFL is like a plantation. It's like a professional exactly. plantation. Oh. Apologies. No, sorry. That was, a, there was, that was like a sensor. That was like a far off sensor. They're like, what? Yeah. Did you just call the NFL a plantation? <laughs> yeah, the NFL is a plantation system um, yeah. business. Anyway, There's a great South a... Park episode about that. Uh, it's actually about college football. And Cartman, uh, Cartman walks into the president's office uh, or the athletic director's office of some like college. And he goes, and he's dressed as a uh, Colonel Sanders. The plantation owner. He's like, hey, how you doing? He's like, uh, hey, I'm just trying to figure out how do I get some of those slaves that you got? Guys like, uh, what? Excuse me? He's like, oh, yes, not slaves. How do I get some of that money for free from people that are working around getting paid? Of course, 
Yes. That's changed now because now we have sports endorsements and young college millionaires. Right. Especially right. if they're twins and blonde, apparently. There was yeah, a yeah. The, did you see the blonde twins that have made like millions? University of Miami, they're kinda like nondescript point guards. Right. Yeah. University I can't of remember Miami. their name off the top of my head. It's okay. it's a well it's funny because those two little beautiful little white girls uh, <laughs> who, who <laughs> <laughs> who play point and shooting guard at the University of Miami on an otherwise all black team? They're the ones making all the money. Can you imagine those locker room conversations? It's like, uh, it's like I don't think you guys are the best uh, players on this team, but somehow you're richer than me. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to Oof. figure out what that is. And they're like, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why that might be. Have you tried Pantene? Have you tried? <laughs> right, right, right. There was this horrible thing that happened in the 1970s and 80s where black people started lightening, lightening their skin because apparently it yeah. mattered. Yeah. yeah, boy, is it getting hot in here? <laughs> is it getting hot in here? I just, my point is, I don't think you can fix a plantation system. Yeah. And the NCAA yeah. is that. I mean, that's the NCAA was created specifically to control black athletes. I don't know that history. There's but a great I, Taylor I, Branch series. Taylor mm -hmm. Branch wrote the Pillars of Fire trilogy of Martin Luther King, great right. historian. And he was the first one to call the college football plantation system, but also to put the NCAA on blast because the student athlete uh, moniker is actually made up out of thin air. It mm -hmm. was designed not to have to pay for medical costs of football players very and interesting. also to lock in black players right into the university and pull them away from what was then common practice of getting paid right right like will chamberlain was paid when yeah. he was in kansas he wrote he wrote drove a cadillac like that was just yeah yeah, yeah. whatever so the huh. whole thing is designed with a very particular purpose in mind but anyway wow i'm sure we'll get it right I'm sure we'll get it right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the Welcome to America podcast. Is that what we called it at the beginning? I think so. Yeah. Welcome to America. Welcome to America. Uh, or did, wait, 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 wait. What was the Eddie Murphy movie? Coming to Coming, coming to America. Coming That's to what America. we called it. Coming okay, it's not Welcome to America. Coming to America. Thanks so much for listening to the Coming to America podcast, where we've obviously worked everything out ahead of time. My name is Damien DeNoble. <laughs> Eli McDonald. This is Frontier Tech Law, and we will see you next time on episode two. Eventually we'll have a guest. Probably not for a while, though. Have a great day. 